cheap version. So, so, so we're looking at the flash-based. Because cost-wise, you know, the, these can potentially become the, the, the memory for low-priced de devices, right? Mm. The, uh, the uh, cross point, uh, X point is going to be uh, definitely going to be more expensive in the, uh, in the server space. So we're talking about, about 10 times the, the price difference. Wow. Yeah. So I was, I've always been wondering, I, I noticed a lot of these supercomputers yeah. now have flash memory on yeah. each node. Yeah. Yeah. How do they? Those are useful buffer, uh, buffer storage. So they don't, do they don't mm -hmm. load it and, and restore it when they're starting a new job then? Uh, that they do checkpointing, that's exactly right. They mostly use the, fly, uh, the, uh, the SSDs for the checkpointing. But when they're like loading a new job into yeah. the machine, are yeah. they loading data into that flash memory or it's not used for that purpose? You, at least the systems that I'm familiar with, they don't use that for, uh, they, they mostly just use it for Buffering, you know, uh, for for like I/O buffers and um, uh, checkpointing, and then they just discard it when the yeah. job uh, is done. done. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. that's my part. The, that's the, at least the two systems I'm familiar with. That's how it works. So, hmm. so yeah. in the system that uh, the what was it Aurora or I forgot the name of the one yeah. that you're involved in. The, the Blue Waters is uh, the one that we're yeah. directly involved. Is that yeah. one a power system, a power PC? No, uh, it's actually um, x86, uh, AMD x86, and uh, NVIDIA uh, GPUs. The, uh, oh, it's wow. a Kepler generation. So did, did AMD and NVIDIA, uh, uh, you know, sort of. I, I know NVIDIA and IBM made a thing where they're yeah. the flip side bus between yeah, yeah, the yeah, two. Yeah. Did they do that with AMD and NVIDIA? No, it's PCIe. That's uh, they, they go to PCIe. So so that's actually part of the problem. It, uh, it's not I ideal. So so if uh, NVIDIA was willing to work with IBM to do that front yeah. side bus thing, why yeah. wouldn't they do mm -hmm. the same thing with AMD? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. And but uh, they tried to do the same thing with Intel. Intel refused. Yeah. So, but I don't know about I AMD. Yeah. Sorry. They, yeah. Intel and, a, and Nvidia. Yeah. Sort of they don't. They don't, don't each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would think Nvidia AMD, AMD, AMD would yeah. be a better. Yeah. yeah. I, that I don't know. I really don't know why why it didn't work. So when you go over PCIe instead of the front side bus, yeah, yeah. you said that. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much do you give up from that? Um, you know, so um, if you do the front side bus, it's about, uh, um, let me think, 150 gigabyte per second. Mm -hmm. If you do the PCIe today, uh, it's uh, 16, uh, it's 16 gigabyte per second. Wow, that's a big difference. Yes. But is it, is it just a bandwidth thing yeah, or yeah. is the latency also, I, I mean the front side bus is cash per unit, yeah, right. so exactly. I would think that yeah. would be yeah. you know, a latency mm -hmm. advantage also. Yes, there is a little bit of the latency of advantage, especially because PCIe has a protocol, it's a serial bus with protocol. Yeah. So the latency may be about twice. But even just as a programming model, yeah. when it, because of, of the yeah. with the front yeah. side bus being cash mm -hmm. per yeah. unit, it yeah. must make the programming simpler. Yes. It should be, but um, but most of the high performance codes still use the uh, you know use the data copy rather than the coherent mode. Yeah. So because uh, you know the coherent mode is still lower bandwidth. Hmm. Yeah. So are you? Are you teaching classes on the GPU programming? Yes, you I do. You still do that? Because yeah. you're yeah. one of the beginner, uh -huh. yeah. at the very beginning of GPU. Yeah. I'm actually beginning to uh, I, I release a teaching kit for the university. So I'm in the process of releasing uh, a whole batch of graduate level course uh, videos online. So, so have, you, have you done that through yeah. either edX yeah. or yeah. Coursera? Or Coursera. I, I oh did a Coursera, Coursera course. You did? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So yeah. those are on Coursera now? Yeah. Uh, they are, um, I don't know what happened uh, because I, I, I did not have time to teach Coursera in the past five years. Okay. So the last one I taught was five years ago. So I don't, okay. I don't know exactly what happened to the videos. Okay. So, so I'm, I'll check. Okay. Yeah, that five a lot happens in the GPU area yeah. in five years. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah. It, 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 things change. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm actually updating uh, the, some of the things. You know, the, um, the, I, we, we updated the textbook. 
So uh, you know, I'm going to release a, a new batch of videos online. So because you know, the, the, a lot of people have been asking. So so that's my summer project. Is there a, is there a domain specific language if you if mm -hmm. what you want to do is write vector code? Is yeah. has someone made a domain specific language to make that easier? To just take advantage of the vectorization in x86. That's a very good question. I don't think so. so. I don't think so. What I want with some, so, so you know how Intel keeps yeah, 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 making yeah, yeah. those vectors yeah, yeah. bigger, bigger, longer, and longer. longer. Yeah, yeah. It'd ABX be nice, now. It'd yeah. be nice if if you could just even if you had to write the code for mm -hmm. five yeah, twelve yeah. bit vectors. Mm -hmm. But it would just run yeah, slower, slower on the 256 yeah, bit yeah. and on the 128 even slower. Yeah, yeah, but at least yeah. the code would I know. run. I, that would I, be a big I understand. Yeah. I don't think there's a uh, there's a, uh, a DSL for that. Uh, most of the DSLs are n uh, now are the tensors, right? Um, mm. And I haven't seen it. Would, yeah. it, would it even be practical to use TensorFlow mm -hmm. to, if what you really wanted was mm -hmm. um, vectorization, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. stuff for not that's that's not yeah. in the math kernel yeah. library? Does that would that even work, or is it, it could be very slow? It could work. It could work. Oh. It may not even be that slow. So that let me know. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Or a Saturday day long training class, like a seven or eight hour long mm -hmm. class mm -hmm. that would be uh, have a minor charge for. Mm -hmm. And so, if I could, um, if anyone's interested in that topic, could you please raise your hand? Okay, you five. I can count it about five. Okay. All right. Um, how many we've, we've already put on a couple in the last six months? Uh, talks on uh, TensorFlow, the last one was on TensorFlow, uh, should we use TensorFlow using Kubernetes? Uh, would anyone be interested in additional um, seminars on TensorFlow one day in the week? Keep your hands up, I'll count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. 18. Okay, thank you very much. Well, TensorFlow 2.0 just came out. Maybe we could make some arrangements with uh, TensorFlow 2.0. Um, it had a lot of uh, newer features that, if you're familiar with um, some of the other uh, infrastructures, uh, that would work well. Um, so, a little bit of background about ACM. Our local, the ACM International.org was founded in the Bay Area in 1947. 
our local chapter here was founded 10 years later in 1957. So uh, we've been having computer science talks since 1957, once a month. And we started our data science city about 2006. And we've been adding monthly talks on that. So now we have two talks a month in general uh, with the data science. Um, so we have a meetup.com, which is a primary website for upcoming talks. Please register for that. It helps us give a better estimate for our food, food purchases. And then on our YouTube channel, about two weeks later, we post up the videos. And then the videos will come up on our YouTube site. So I haven't updated my count, but the last count was about 130 videos between the general computing and the data science. These are some of the upcoming events. Uh, we have a streak of uh, more data science discussions. So on uh, June 19th, uh, human intuition, decision analysis, and value of information. June 24th, real-time monitor of Twitter network infrastructure with Aaron. Um, so Aaron will be another uh, data flow, but big data architecture. Um, then July 17th, inside the black box, how does uh, Neuralnet understand news? And then on the 22nd of July, best practices in data science on rapid model development and faster production development um, by the creator of Apache Zeppelin um, and co-founder and CEO of Zeppelin. So those are some upcoming talks that might be of interest. You can find them all on our meetup site. We also welcome volunteers. Uh, we have a volunteer dinner, generally first Monday of the month, where we get together and plan our upcoming events, whether it's inviting speakers, uh, finding locations, or uh, planning different media training events. So one of the things I was looking at for a possible training event would be OpenCV. Um, <laughs> so I was talking to the CEO of OpenCV earlier today, he's giving a talk at the Embedded Vision Conference. <coughs> is OpenCV a subject of interest for doing uh, deep learning types of things? Or scoring faster? Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Um, so also there's audience announcements. Um, I'll go from one side of the room to another. If your company is hiring or you know a local conference or meetup, uh, raise your hand. Uh, yes, do we make an announcement? Uh, sure. Uh, I think I talked down here. Sound good? Yep. Go ahead and stand up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks, the audience. Yeah, just, just a small group of friends. Small group? Uh, so I'm from eBay. I'm part of the site reliability engineering team here, and we are hiring right now. Uh, we really need some good data science background from people. Uh, we work on right now our developing machine learning algorithms for anomaly detection uh, to try to try to find root cause incidents and stop things before they affect our customers. Um, we also, if you have any networking or database skills, it's also really helpful. If you're interested, email me at m a x p o o l e at ebay.com. That's Max Pool with an e at the end, a swimming pool at ebay.com. Thank you. Okay, data science for eBay. Thank you very much. Um, raise your hand. Any other announcements people want to make? And since it's a long room, maybe I'll walk back this way. Easier for the coach so we want to do an announcement. Other announcements? Hiring? Other meetups? Or conferences? My CEO. Any other announcements? Back on this side? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, so for the video recording for our YouTube channel, as an audience member, if you ask a question, it won't be picked up by the mic on the speaker, uh, which will get saved for YouTube. So please keep your questions short enough that the speaker can repeat them. So like 45 seconds. If you give like a two minute context plus a list of five questions, then just expect the speaker to say, oh, that's very good, let's talk about it afterwards. Um, if you can keep it in short bites, you can always raise your hand a second time. Fair enough. Oh, fair enough. Um, okay, so now I'd like to introduce our speaker. So emerging AI applications and infrastructure systems with Active Storage Class member. Sorry for the cutoff part, going from Mac to PC, I think there was a little burp there. Um, so it's by um, Wen Mei uh, Hu. So since 2012, much progress has been made in image, video, and NLP, self-driving vehicles, cashierless stores, human-level interactive robot systems, human intelligence augmentation. So research challenges remain with respect to computational methods, hardware and software infrastructures, innovations in scale, 
iterative solvers, graph algorithms, and increasingly large data storage, access latency, energy efficiency. So we'll be presenting on recent progress on AI in task libraries, AI application prototyping, talking about the Eurodyte system at the IBM Illinois um, C3 S4. SR. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, chair of the, he's a chair of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign. Uh, director of the Impact Research Group. He co directs the IBM Illinois Center for Cognitive and Computing <coughs> System Research, C3SR. Right? So please have a warm round of applause to welcome our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. And then also for the ACM members, later on we'll be having a rapid drawing uh, for copies of their civil rights. Okay. Uh, thanks for coming in uh, on this uh, Wednesday evening. And um, uh, it's, it's a really honor to be able to come here uh, at the, uh, the most important chapter of ACM. And I've been an ACM member since I was a student. And uh, so I'm not going to tell you exactly how many years, but uh, it's been more than 30 years for me. And uh, you know, so this is a wonderful organization, and I really hope that uh, you know, the, the next 40 years will be as great as the previous uh, you know, the, I think it's been about 50, 60 years, right? Okay, so, um, wait, uh, slides, let me see. Here, great. Okay, so um, I'm gonna be talking about uh, some of the recent work that uh, we have been doing in the area of uh, applications and systems. AI has attracted a lot of uh, attention in industry and uh, uh, we're beginning to see <coughs> very active development in terms of self-driving cars, which is you know, the, definitely a, a incredibly uh, you know, a fascinating topic. But then uh, as we begin to build um, you know, real ap AI applications, in, you know, even in some of the, I would say, uh, less, uh, you know, I would say less dramatic areas, uh, we start to see some very interesting you know, computational uh, challenges and we're beginning to see some very interesting you know, engineering issues in terms of you know, just to get some of these applications right. And uh, so I'm going to talk about some of that experience and hopefully uh, you know, these kind of systems that we're building will, uh, you know, will help people's understanding of you know, uh, how, the system, uh, how the technologies really work and how you know, the, the future uh, work uh, will likely uh, add to the uh, capabilities. So just to give you a little bit of an uh, you know, introduction to the uh, IBM Illinois uh, Center for Cognitive Computing Systems Research, that's C3SR. Um, I'm personally, I'm a, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, C3PO and uh, you know, the R2D2. So the, when we came up with the acronym, obviously, you know, the, I wanted to have something like C3. So this is, you know, hopefully the little, you know, sister of uh, C3PO. Um, so we, you know, we wanted to create game-changing AI technologies and systems. And um, uh, so we want to be able to achieve sub-millisecond uh, response time for AI applications that augment human uh, capability. And I'm going to uh, you know, show you a few examples about how we actually go and augment human uh, capabilities today. So uh, we also noticed that um, uh, many of these things need to be co-designed. So uh, you know, the, um, when, we, when I talk to AI, uh, researchers, I, what I mean is the AI, more uh, from the application point of view, uh, many of them are uh, uh, focusing on focus, I would say, somewhat smaller uh, you know, uh, areas such as, you know, the, let's say, understanding the, uh, you know, something like a identity, you know, the uh, you know, uh, uh, name identity uh, association or some kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, work in terms of temporal detection and so on. But very few people in the academia today are building large AI applications. So industry is really leading in that area. So we have to work with industry to understand, you know, the, the bigger applications. And, but then um, there is a critical shortage of AI task libraries. And um, uh, in order to build real applications, we will need to have a lot more of these open source AI task libraries. If you, uh, we mentioned OpenCV. OpenCV is a you know, fairly good uh, you know, collection of code 
that people can use to build computer vision you know, the, uh, applications. And there are many, many mundane things that you have to you know, be able to do, e even including some of the image video co decoding and, and so on. So the, you know, we need to have something equivalent to that, and the, the challenge is actually quite large. And platforms and tools, uh, right now uh, we have very minimal uh, you know, um, uh, number of tools that people can actually use to be able to develop, to debug, and to understand uh, you know, these uh, you know, the so hardware and software systems. And AI hardware, you know, um, we use GPUs today, we use FPGAs, you know, um, we're at Xilinx today, so you know, the, you know, there are lots and lots of you know, hardware work. But even with all this work, we're, begin, we're seeing for some serious applications, we still have you know, a lot of challenges in terms of latency, in terms of how you know, the robust these things are. Uh, the funding is about $20 million for IBM, DARPA, NSF, and SRC, and we have 14 faculty members. And uh, this is a very, very uh, interdisciplinary uh, team. We have top experts in computer vision, we have top experts in natural language processing, and we also have top experts in FPGA, high-level synthesis, right? So the, this is, you know, the, so there, the, these, uh, we, uh, we have a top uh, expert in graph analytics. So these are the, the, the graph faculty and, uh, that work with about 40 grad students to, you know, the, to develop applications and to, uh, to, to develop tools and so on that, uh, you know, that we uh, help each other to understand the problem. And we have been publishing papers at top system conferences and uh, uh, AI conferences uh, in, uh, in the past uh, two and a half years. So, the, you know, so it, it, it's been a really, really good journey. But in my mind, these papers are great. But unless we build real applications and real systems that would uh, be, you know, be used by industry, by used by uh, you know, the broad uh, you know, user uh, team, we don't have a legacy. So that, that's you know, the work we're really focusing on today. So let me go into uh, you know, uh, the, the AI applications that we care about. So in, the, uh, in, the, in, in 2011, uh, IBM you know, that made a big splash. So uh, you know, the, uh, they built uh, a uh, Watson system, and uh, this Watson system uh, consists of 90 uh, IBM Power 750 series servers, and um, uh, so the, they have a total of 80 teraflops uh, you know, uh, aggregated uh, compute throughput. 80 teraflops is a lot, but in today's standard, 80 teraflops is not you know, anything to be totally scared about, right? Uh, we can easily build you know, a TPU, for example, you know, the will have, you know, will be able to exceed this, uh, you know, the um, throughput. But um, uh, it does have 15 terabytes of DRAM. And this is beginning to get a little bit more interesting. You know, even though we can easily build a, you know, 100 terabyte, uh, you know, the teraflop system, uh, you know, system with, you know, fairly small amount of uh, hardware logic, building a 15 terabyte uh, the DRAM system is still very, very challenging. So, so that's, you know, that we're, you know, the, especially for things like uh, home assistance and self-driving cars, you know, the, if you think about it, Watson is, uh, the, the, is a very, uh, I would say, you know, the, uh, is a home assistant dialogue system on steroids, right? Now, it, it answers a lot of these questions under three seconds, and then, you know, the, it has a, a lot of very sophisticated natural language processing, probably still in some ways better than uh, most of the, the home assistant pro uh, products. So I'm going to kind of go into uh, this a little bit. Um, the way that uh, Watson answers uh, questions is what we call the uh, you know, hypothesis-based approach. That is, you know, uh, when someone asks a question, let's say uh, during Jeopardy, you know, the, when the host asks that question, uh, the system immediately produces a large number of hypotheses about how to interpret that question. As simple as something like the city of Toronto. If, you know, if someone asks uh, about the city of Toronto, there are actually quite a few cities of Toronto in North America. So you know, the, even though for human it's very uh, easy to, to say, oh, that's the Toronto in Canada, uh, there is a real instance when during the computation, uh, the, the IBM system actually identified Toronto, Ohio as the city. And then they went down the wrong path, right? So this was one of the, the famous you know, the, uh, blooper, uh, 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 bloopers that, uh, you know, that, that people talk about all the time. So you know, the art of making sure that uh, you generate all these 
potential interpretations of the question. And then, based on the, uh, the interpretation of the question, you go and look for answers. And this is where a lot of machine learning, a lot of the, you know, the data searching uh, methods you know, the, will need to be. And then, eventually, you also have what we call the evidence source. That is, when you come up with the answers, you also go back and say, if I assume this answer, you know, can I have corroborating evidence that you know, this answer makes sense? So, so they have a secondary search to make sure that, that the answers are consistent with some of the secondary uh, information sources. And, uh, and then they, uh, they grade all the uh, consistency and then pick the top score that is the answer. So if we look at you know, the technology that we use in, you know, let's say, Google Home today or in, the, uh, uh, in uh, Amazon Echo, um, you know, the rigor of that conversation is not nearly as strong as the system. They have, you know, but they also advance the, the technology in many other ways. So, you know, so the, this is you know, something that we, you know, we, uh, we, we see in the future. That is, you know, as we uh, build better and better, you know, let's say, home assistant systems, uh, we're going to begin to have to have a lot more information stored locally for low latency verification and uh, the low latency interpretation of what the person is talking about and a large amount of past con context information that will be used as the secondary evidence because you know the kind of answers you come up with should be consistent with the conversation that you had with this person in the past right so so there are a lot of these kind of interesting you know the challenges that we need to uh, uh, to be able to meet building a really good ai system uh, in collaboration with IBM, we built a automatic generation uh, a system to automatically generate sport highlight and, and analytics. And this system was actually used in 2017 uh, for the Wimbledon uh, you know, the, uh, high, uh, uh, video highlight generation. And um, uh, so this was uh, made a lot of splash. And um, uh, if we look at uh, the system sort of the, under the hood, uh, this system is actually built uh, based on uh, you know, a, lot, uh, six, uh, a fairly large number of uh, servers, and each server will have the video uh, neural net, audio neural net, and then you know the, there's going, uh, there's a secondary audio, uh, you know, the, the, uh, sort of the secondary machine learned based uh, aggregation method, so that we can detect the exciting part of the videos. And you know, even though this is, this is something that is of, you know, that definitely of commercial value and is actually being deployed uh, you know, in, uh, in network broadcasting and so on today, but you can easily imagine that there are other very important applications. For example, in video surveillance, you know, most of the video is boring, right? But then uh, you, you, whenever there's something meaningful, you want to be able to detect it and then be able to, you know, to, to capture the moments that uh, things are important. Right, and so there, you know, many of these things that are, you know that would, you know, fall into the uh, the kind of the application of this. So, um, you know, we recently built a AI system uh, to assist the uh, assignment of reviewers, uh, you know, the, uh, for conferences. So uh, this is uh, actually, you know, something that uh, people have been working on for a while because uh, you know, the number of papers submitted to pay, uh, to conferences have been increasing. So the, I just talked to uh, the, uh, the NIPS uh, you know, the, you know, the organizing team, and uh, they have thousands of papers, right? So you know, the, when, when, by, by the time uh, the deadline uh, re, uh, comes tomorrow, tomorrow is the NIPS submission deadline. They expect thousands of papers, and in a few days, they need to assign the thousands of papers to all the you know, reviewers. And the program committee is not large enough to review all the thousands of papers, so they have to enlist outside uh, external experts. Uh, finding experts to review thousands of papers is not a simple matter. So the, the, there's a Toronto system today, and um, that, uh, it, it has some really good technology inside, but it has a major weakness. The major weakness is that the reviewers have to go onto the website and enter the, uh, his own or her own expertise in terms of keywords. And then they will use the keyword to match into the papers and that, you know, so derive the, uh, you know, the match. Um, 
it turns out that this is, a vi uh, this is a major weakness because for one thing, most of us, when we hear about reviews, we kind of run the other way. So you know, you, you're not going to get a lot of reviewers to go onto the website and you know, enter their, you know, their expertise. So what we did was that uh, for, you know, uh, for a conference, we will go back, uh, the data set is available, by the way, uh, you know, the, the data set is Microsoft uh, Academic Graph. And in that uh, data set, they actually have all the major conference past papers in abstract and title. So we, actually, we, we go to the uh, micro, uh, Microsoft Academic Graph, ingest all the abstracts of previous papers for that conference. Just to give you an example, uh, we just finished a, uh, you know, a deployment uh, uh, process, uh, complete process with ISCA, the International Symposium on Computer Architecture. And this conference had about 45 years worth of you know, the publications. So we went back to the Microsoft uh, you know, the, uh, academic graph. We uh, ingested all the abstracts. And then we ingested all the authors so that uh, we, we, uh, we, we, uh, pro we process the information and extract what we call the meaningful technical uh, concepts. So these are phrases that have technical meaning. And this is actually not a trivial uh, ma matter. And even the best tools that uh, today exist today, we still have a very f a fair amount of noise in that uh, in, in that pro uh, you know, the results. And then we take all the papers uh, that are submitted today, right? And uh, we take we, we ingest those abstracts. Uh, we use the neural nets to generate uh, a domain-specific word to vec. So we generate high-dimensional vectors based on the phrase detection. So we have multiple layers of uh, uh, levels of neural networks just to be able to get to the point where we have some meaningful way to compare the papers. And then we use different distance measurement. And uh, as a secondary, we use the co-author relationships that we can uh, automatically detect in and uh, detect the conflict interest so that uh, we can avoid assigning the paper, that the current paper, to one of the Co previous co-authors of these authors and uh, avoid conflict of interest. This sounds pretty uh, simple, but it turned out to be a lot more complicated than you would imagine because people have same names. And then sometimes people even have different spellings of the name. So you know, when you look at a name, and the, the, this is the name at, uh, you know, the uh, uh, identity assignment, uh, you know, entity assignment. So you know, the, these are the very fundamental AI problems that we have been working on for you know, decades. And we have made a lot of progress, but we, I cannot tell you today, based on everything that I have seen, that these problems are truly solved. So you know, for many of you who are wondering you know, what, the, what are the interesting research work that, uh, you know, let's say you, know, you, you have a little bit of time every day and you would like to do some research, you know, there are plenty of these kind of problems that you can spend time and you will make very substantial contribution to the future uh, of our field. So, uh, you know, the, the, but even with all these challenges and then the approximations and inaccuracies and so on, um, you know, the recommendations that we made uh, in, the, uh, the, uh, in the ISCA uh, assignment, 70% of our recommendations were accepted by the program committee. And uh, so this is the user interface, and we, we blot out the, uh, the, uh, the, the names and uh, contact information of the reviewers just so that they would protect their identity. So, uh, but you know, the, the, the program committee chair told me that uh, you know, if, we did, if it, they did not have this system support, they would have missed about half of the reviewers that we recommended but the humans would not be able to come up with that, uh, you know, about half of those reviewers. So the quality would have suffered because of that. Okay. So these are you know, good contributions that we can make. But uh, if you look at the kind of the under, uh, under the hood, um, you know, the, uh, the review system uh, use you know, uh, several important pieces of technology. And this is what, this is what we call the AI task library. You know, uh, so well, one is name entity disambiguation or assignment, and uh, another one is topic modeling, and we, uh, we use a, a, a combination of LDA and a uh, you know, uh, bag of words kind of uh, approach. 
And um, uh, that's uh, apparently the state of the art in the, uh, in the text mining community. And then uh, uh, you know, we use that uh, both to generate a reviewer profile, and then uh, we, use the, uh, we, we use the same technology to generate uh, the income, to sort of the submitted paper uh, profile, and then we do a, a, a big topic matching by doing the high dimensional vector projection. And eventually, we also need to do the conflict interest, right? And so uh, at some point, we will end up with all these kind of matches, conflicts, and so on. Then we solve a big optimization problem. The reason is we need to you know, make sure that not in, uh, not, there's no one in the reviewer pool that will receive 100 assignments, right? If you receive 100 assignments, you're going to just say, sorry, guys, I'm not going to do anything about this. So you know, on the other hand, we also need to make sure that every paper has enough reviews. Some of the papers will have fewer candidates than others. So it's a big global optimization problem. And that problem usually takes about four hours to run. Right? So some of these things actually take a long, long time. And then they're not instantaneous. Okay. And uh, so we have ways to go in terms of you know, making these systems smooth, you know, easy to use and very fast iterations and so on, and we're not there yet. But they are already helping, right? Even though these things are still uh, you know, early, still primitive, but they're already providing value. So we are now uh, testing the system at uh, Micro 19, which is ongoing, and then uh, we're, we're beginning to talk to more of the program chairs uh, in, the, uh, in, uh, in bigger and bigger conferences. So with those applications, you know, I already started to touch uh, you know, a few of these AI task libraries. In my mind, this is going to be the critical, critical advancement that, that the field has to make. If we can make good quality, you know, uh, good quality, efficient AI task libraries that will dramatically improve the advancement of applications. People will begin to, 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 to create new applications, innovative applications. People will be able to use these you know, the, uh, the sort of components to create the applications that we don't even currently know about, we have not even thought about in the, uh, you know, uh, in the next few years. So, um, so these are important building blocks of AI applications. In the image video domain, what we found out are the most important ones are the object detection, tracking, and classification. And these are all require somewhat different uh, you know, pre-processing of, uh, of the image and video. And they would also require somewhat different uh, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, output capabilities. So for example, uh, if you're just doing uh, detection, you can just draw some bounding boxes. But if you do, do tracking, you will need to be able to identify the same object you know, the, in, in different video for frames and so on. So there, you know, these, when you come down to the details, these you know, libraries, uh, you know, the test libraries have, you know, actually end up doing very different things. Texture grounding is the foundation for understanding videos and images. So essentially, it, it, it takes the uh, video or image as input and generate a text that describes that uh, image or uh, video. Content-based searching, you know, how do we, you know, uh, you know, uh, if someone gives us a drawing and say, okay, you know, the, this is the person that I remembered, how do you go into a huge database and then find the, the people with the, the right kind of features, right? So the, for doc document understanding, um, you know, we, uh, we need to, uh, we, st we still, uh, we really need to have several important, uh, important pieces. One is temporal relations. This turned out to be the critical component for understanding causal relationships. So the, you know, the, if you read a piece of article, you need to be able to, to draw a timeline, right? So when we were young in the elementary school and so on, oftentimes the teacher will ask us to read a par you know, some kind of paragraph and say, and then ask us to draw a timeline with the, the novel, right? You read a, a book and then say, here, you know, what are the important events? And why? Because the, that, that timeline helps us to understand the sequence of events, and then it will feed into the cause and consequence understanding of these things. They are not directly, you know, uh, directly, uh, you know, the, uh, answer, uh, answering the questions, but they are the fu important foundation for us to understand the causal relations. The causal relations understanding is really, really hard today. You know, when we look at uh, the, the machine 
uh, machine uh, uh, the generated causal relations versus human were probably still close to random, <laughs> okay, from the, uh, you know, the, the machines that what the machines can generate. Name entity disambiguation. You know, when, uh, when we uh, you know, read through these articles, you know, the, whenever we have he, she, it, and, uh, and so on, you know, with exactly which, you know, which person or with, uh, you know, uh, which entity you know, these things are referring to, and we can grossly misunderstand a, you know, a statement if we don't if we assign the, entity, uh, the names to the wrong entities. And um, uh, topic modeling. And topic modeling is really about understanding, you know, uh, let's say, uh, if you read an article, there's clearly a concept in there, okay? Let's say, uh, you know, you, when you listen to my, my presentation, I have a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about a few concepts. But then, how, uh, how can you concisely describe the concepts that I was trying to convey with a few words, right? And this, so that uh, you can you know, uh, re reproduce the concept and you can kind of you know, uh, 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 even rephrase some of these concepts in a better way. And uh, so the semantic capacity, this is actually one of the, you know, the very, very interesting uh, problems that, uh, uh, that many researchers are working on today. Um, the words that we, we use um, you know, the, every day have sort of different levels of detailed or uh, what we call the capacity. So for example, computer science, you know, and you know, uh, let's say algorithm. These two you know, the phrases have different capacity. Computer science is in some ways more general than algorithms because computer science also has, you know, let's say compilers, and, uh, which may use algorithms or may use other things. On the other hand, algorithm can in some ways be broader than computer science because there are some algorithms in other fields. Right, so so the, each word have some of these kind of you know the, the, the capacity, and when whenever you say Wen Mei Hu is let's say a computer scientist, and you know you will probably say okay so and so is a physicist, rather than you know saying you know so and so is a you know the, is you know let's say some some kind of a uh, you know. Uh, uh, expert in spin, uh, in, in spin memory in the quantum computing and da da da. So these are the comparable sort of, you, know, you, you should be using comparable phrases when you refer to people and try to distinguish people in a comparable and uh, you know, un, uh, comprehensible way. And sentiment analysis, this is uh, you know, uh, another very, very active uh, topic that people are uh, you know, uh, studying. How do we, you know, the, uh, 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 analyze the fact that a paper referring to another paper is is that because the authors are building the work on that paper, or the author is saying that the other paper is nonsense, right? So the, there's you know the you know the, some of these you know the uh, results can make big difference when we try to begin to produce quantifiable results from these AI tools, right? So uh, the uh, computational creativity. How do we, you know, the make uh, our results more interesting? How can we, you know, the, when we start to generate documents out of, you know, AI pipelines, how can they not sound mechanical? How can they sound not robotic? And uh, when we start to, you know, generate, you know, let's say, you know, some of these, uh, you know, the, uh, when we uh, try to use AI uh, uh, pipelines to uh, to come up with explanations of how math problems can be solved. Can we figure out different ways of explaining the, uh, the, the concept so that some of the students will find some certain styles you know, that are more useful and some students will find other styles useful? Without the ability to create variations, we will not be able to uh, or apply creativity to generating these kind of uh, out outcome. We will not be able to match the AI output to different people with different needs, people with different background, and so on. So, just to give you, you know, the, a little bit, uh, you know, kind of, you know, the, the, uh, a little bit overview of, you know, where these AI task libraries uh, are today. For object detection and tracking, um, you know, the library, uh, you know, task library that we produce, uh, we uh, we participated in the 2017 NVIDIA AI System Challenge. Out of 29 teams, and we we we, uh, we rank number one. 
So this is, you know, this is a, a, a usage of that, uh, you know, tracking, uh, you know, system. So basically, we take, uh, we we go to the traffic uh, camera and we identify all the vehicles and the speed that they're going, right? So that's the, you know, the, uh, the first part is the uh, object detection, and the second part is the tracking, so that you can, you can find the speed, right? You can estimate the speed out of it. And then, uh, you know, you, uh, you, you actually have to, you know, be able to, uh, uh, to deal with the various conditions, lighting, occlusion, grouping, fast motion, right? So, so you know, this is where the tire hits the road, and the, the, the object tracking, you know, the object detection, sound, these things sound easy, but as soon as you start to deploy that in you know, real environments, you start to go into all kinds of complications, right? And then you know, things start to fail. And um, uh, person parsing, so the, the, this is uh, you know, a, uh, a subfield of uh, you know, segmentation, but human par uh, you know, person, uh, person parsing is a very, very important subfield because uh, this allows us to understand you know, the, the, the human activities, and uh, these are, this is the foundation for you know, the understanding, uh, for example, you know, uh, uh, if the person is you know, the, uh, you know, going, which direction is the per person going, or you know, what are the gestures being made, and so on. So, so the, this is, you know, the, uh, again, another very important uh, you know, component uh, in, the, uh, in, in the task library. So uh, we rank number one in the CBPR uh, you know, challenge for uh, single multiple person and fine grain uh, multiple person. Um, one of the very in, uh, the challenging you know, aspect of the, you know, the AI systems is to find the relevant parts of a knowledge. So you know the, you, you can imagine that um, you know when we build, uh, for example, the Microsoft you know academic graph, that graph is a huge graph, and um, so we you know we oftentimes need to extract the relevant part of these graphs. So a very common uh, you know the uh, need for uh, graph analytics is to be able to you know to partition uh, the graphs you know into you know into relevant components, and uh, one of the fundamental uh, foundational approach for you know, the finding the, uh, the kind of the, uh, the components of a graph is the triangle counting. So that's one very, very basic approach. And this particular uh, computation turned out to be a lot more uh, you know, challenging than most people would imagine. So I'm showing you know, these different types of graphs, you know, Amazon purchasing graph, you know, the uh, Friendster uh, links, and then uh, protein, amino acid uh, substrings, and internet co connectivity. So the, the reason why these things can be very, very different, uh, difficult, is that uh, when you have an algorithm that counts, you know, let's say, the, the triangles in your graph, and some of the graphs can actually begin to totally destroy your parallelism. And then uh, you can start to get into extremely serial computation when you have a node that has many, 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 many uh, uh, neighbors versus a graph where you know, everyone has roughly the same number of neighbors. So the, this is you know, classical load balancing problem, but it actually happens in reality. And in some of these graphs, you can, you know, you, you can start to see a, you know, the same size graph may take a few seconds, then it may take a few hours. Okay, and this is you know the, this, these are the kind of challenges that uh, you know we often run into when we uh, you know, try to even apply some of the simpler uh, algorithms to you know to very very big uh, data structure. So uh, so we routinely uh, need to de decompose or the, the partition graphs. And um, so uh, there's a new, uh, we, uh, many of you probably use methods you know, or H methods to partition the graphs. And uh, what we found out is that uh, for very, very large graphs, you know, the you know, it, it, methods and H methods you know, would take you know, just an unacceptable amount of time. So we started to find approximation algorithms to be able to, you know, to have scalable uh, graph partitioning capability. This is especially important when we do dynamic graph and analytics. So uh, what we develop uh, in collaboration with some, uh, you know, the graph uh, uh, experts is a, uh, what we call the cross decomposition. So uh, the left is the uh, the connectivity matrix of uh, graph, and this, you know, the, it, it looks like kind of a uh, somewhat random. But then, uh, if you do the, you know, if you systematically rename the nodes, uh, you know, in in the graph, 
And then uh, you, st you, you start to uh, you know, rename well, what we call the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the triangles in the graph. Then uh, you start to, you know, to start to generate these you know, uh, clusters. And uh, so this is what we call the cross decomposition. And after a few iterations, you start to have you know, very good way to partition it. So we compare that with Mattis and uh, you know, the standard tools and so on. We're much, much faster. In fact, out the outcome can be actually quite a bit better than the methods and so on. Uh, you know, so th this is you know, something that we will continue to improve you know, the, and uh, apply to the, uh, you know, the, to the uh, large graph analytics problem. And uh, this, you know, uh, I'm showing this slide to, to uh, give you, you know, a little bit more insight into you know, some of the, uh, what we call the expensive computation uh, in AI task libraries. This is the entity resolution or entity, uh, name entity as, uh, uh, association problem. So, uh, so the way you can think about this is that you have all these, you know, the, all these names in, a, uh, uh, in, in an article. And in, in these articles, um, you, you know, for each name, you can assume and you, you can find you know, all the en entities in the, uh, in the article. So you can do a name and entity assignment. So you can think about the names as variables, and each variable can assume the value of one of these entities, right? So when you assign an entity to a name, you cannot no longer assign, assign another entity to that name. So you can formulate this into an integer linear programming problem, and the, the value of each variable can only have you know, one, one of them, right? So not, you know, so you, you can, you, uh, you, then you can say, if you know, if you assign the entity, you know, the, the name to this entity, then there's some cost or some, you know, the, some consequence for assigning that because they may have a contradiction somewhere. So all those contradictions become the linear uh, equations, inequalities, and you want to minimize the total cost. And this is the most accurate way of resolving the name and entity in these re, uh, you know, in articles. However. Linear, integer linear programming is not a trivial computation. It's, you know, it, uh, it's in, uh, the general solution is MP hard. And um, so even in understanding a reasonably short article, we can still be spending quite a bit of computing time solving these problems. So that's, you know, the, this, these are the kind of the, the practical challenges that we're, we're, we're experiencing when we try to have very fast you know, the, you know, the, uh, ingestion algorithms and so on uh, for documents. So, you know, the, so those are the things that we're building and we found out that uh, there are quite a few uh, useful uh, tools and uh, platforms that we're building for ourselves. You know, so that uh, we, when we develop these libraries and applications, uh, we have you know, better ways to understand you know, uh, how well these things are doing and, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, how, and if we need to debug some of these things, you know, we can uh, you know, provide some you know, uh, useful uh, tools. So uh, uh, one of the earlier tools that we built is ML Model Scope. And this is a, uh, a system where when we were uh, studying some of the, um, the, uh, the neural net and machine learning uh, models you know, well, uh, at the earlier days of the uh, project, we realized that we could not really figure out why things, some of these things are running so slowly. And uh, we just saw some, you know, so we, we have some, some guess, and sometimes we call this superstition. So we just kind of say, oh, well, it must be that. And uh, then you, you go and tr try several things, and then uh, you know, none of them work. So we eventually we said, okay, none of it, you know, so that, that's nonsense. So let's build some reasonable profiling tools for these kind of things. But it turned out that these profiling tools are very, very hard to build. Um, you know, if you look at a, uh, a modern, you know, the cloud uh, environment where, you know, the applications use the, uh, you know, the uh, machine learning tools that are based on the, uh, the frameworks, uh, you have a fairly sophisticated. Even try to reconnect. Yeah. It's kind of, uh, ah. Okay, let's try again. Let's see if it works. So, 
So the, you know the, we we have this you know REST API you know the uh, you know the uh, triggering these you know applications. Most uh, many of these applications are written in Java or you know the, uh, you know the Python and so on. And then uh, you know, these applications are often time deployed with containers. And the, the machine, you know, the learned uh, uh, models are distributed, you know, with their own, you know, the uh, uh, containers. And then uh, you have this, you know, API uh, management that uh, that allow people to call the, you know, the, these models. So whenever something runs slowly, uh, you know, how can you figure out where you know, where things went wrong? So we build this tool and we support uh, all the major frameworks and we, we support all the major types of hardware because we routinely need to study how you know, the, each different types of hardware you know, the, the do, the can execute these you know, the, uh, you know, machine learned uh, models. And then uh, you know, we, we have the standard data sets so that you don't have to reload the data set and our students can do the, the experiments and studies very quickly. And then uh, we need to allow users to add models. So far, we have added 300 models. We already have 300 uh, you know, the public models in the, uh, in inside this whole uh, environment. And we can be used within the application pipeline as libraries. So people can easily just say, OK, I want to just call you know, one of your models in, in your machine. So this is a typical study that we do. Um, we, as a group, you know, we we spend a lot of time on GPU computing. You know, the, you know personally, I have been you know uh, working on GPU computing for the past ten years. So, uh, so one of the interesting you know uh, problems is that if you look at the various frameworks, so we're, we're listing uh, you know four of the frameworks here, but uh, you know you, you can add in, uh, pretty much any of the frameworks you want, and then we say, okay, uh, these frameworks somehow end up with different amount of time. You know, the, doing the inference based on exactly the same model, right? So, so you know, so what's the difference? Turns out that uh, you know, the, if you use TensorRT, uh, the convolution is actually merged with ReLU, and NVIDIA has a merged implementation in TensorRT, and uh, uh, so that's for, uh, for convolution plus ReLU, and uh, for all these other uh, the frameworks uh, that they are not tapped into that interface. So, so even though they are eventually all these things are calling CUDNN, calling the same library, but they're actually calling different, they're really calling different library functions and they're, they're having different levels of merging and so on underneath, okay? So just saying that someone is using CUDNN running on the same hardware doesn't tell you much at all in that world. And then, you know, you say, okay, so you, know, you have convolution layer. Why is one of the convolution you know, layer implementation is so much better than the others, right? One is much shorter than uh, some of, uh, uh, another one is longer. So then, uh, you know, you, 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 look, you, you look at, you know, the, the implementations, you will see that, oh, uh, because the convolution is actually, you know, uh, implemented differently uh, with uh, the MXNet and the uh, uh, CAFE2. So, um, the, the, the implementation of convolution in, uh, you know, in CAFE 2 is actually based on uh, you know, a totally different li uh, library function than the MXNet implementation, which is actually a mixture of implementations um, in MXNet. However, counterintuitively, that implementation is actually faster. Okay, so another interesting part is that uh, when we compare hardware, um, you know, we, uh, we, we were, uh, you know, look, when VOTA came out, we did a, a whole series of performance audit and uh, you know, the evaluation of the VOTA GPU on, across different frameworks and different, uh, you know, the, uh, different uh, models. And then we found out that uh, you know, in, uh, in some of the models, the VOTA GPU was actually running slower than the Pascal. So some of my students say, oh, yeah, 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 it's because Volta probably has some kind of power, you know, the, uh, the, the voltage throttling, okay? And then, you know, some, something, something that might trigger some heat, you know, the control. Turned out that it's all about the, the MV link. So the x86 was using PCIe, and then, uh, you know, the, uh, for, for this particular model, you know, the, the, all the time, most of the time was actually spent on copying data uh, uh, from uh, you know, the 144 megabytes of data, uh, uh, data to, to the GPU memory. That's it, right? On the other hand, you know, the, when we use the Pascal, the Pascal was the IBM PA machine, and that machine actually you know, has MVLink, and then uh, you know, the, the data copy cost is much lower. 
So, you know, the, t today ML model scope is one of the three recommended uh, ML perf uh, harness. And um, uh, so if you use an uh, ML model scope, we expose all the uh, profiling capabilities so that uh, you know, when you study your own hardware, you will be able to, t to see if how your hardware affects the overall performance and how much of the, you know, the, your effect accounts for the uh, overall latency. So uh, I want to make a, a, a couple of comments about the, you know, the, how we see the future of uh, AI hardware will likely evolve. So we, we are beginning to see you know, uh, two major categories of AI hardware. You know, this, is, this is not rocket science. You know, the, the, this is pretty much just a quick summary of what everyone is uh, talking about. Um, so we have edge AI devices and then we have cloud AI services or servers. The uh, edge AI devices typically need to do, you know, uh, to, to, uh, to take sensory data and do, you know, reasonable amount of sensor fusion and then, uh, you know, do some inference to be able to have some immediate, uh, you know, actions. So, you know, the, when we look at, uh, you know, things like uh, Amazon Echo or Google Home, uh, we see that, uh, you know, it, the, the sensor data today is mostly, you know, just the, uh, the, uh, the voice input. However, you can easily imagine that uh, they will begin to have you know, uh, uh, things like ra radar or you know, things like you know, the other uh, you know, things so that they can uh, begin to, you know, to do better uh, detection of you know, the, uh, people's presence and then uh, you know, do certain adjustments and so on. For example, the, uh, the, the temperature in the, in the room and so on, right? So uh, you know, th these things need to have low predictable latency. And uh, they need to, uh, they are mostly doing some real-time tactics. You know, they, they do some temperature adjustment. They do a little bit of something. They search the, uh, the, the radio channels for you or something. These are short-term, very quick, you know, tactical movements. And then uh, they do the, uh, they make some common sense decisions. They, 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 don't, they don't really try to think too hard about, uh, you know, what the consequences are. And then uh, you know they, they have a little bit of basic knowledge about uh, you know how, what turning that you know turning the temperature means and, and uh, how to get onto the internet and so on, and uh, you know they do a little bit local optimization. You know the, uh, they mostly use the local activity to make that decision. They don't really try to uh, optimize according to the global context. And then they will do some short-term, uh, you know, have some short-term memory about the, the history of interactions and so on. And these are, you know, pretty much true for, you know, uh, home uh, assistance as well as self-driving cars. Okay, this, uh, if you look at a self-driving car, you will see, you know, exactly, you know, the corresponding uh, the list of characteristics. And then you have the cloud AI servers. And these things will have long and predictable latencies, okay. And uh, uh, how long? Hundreds of milliseconds, okay. And hundreds of milliseconds, depends on your application, can be very short, can be infinity, okay. If you need to take some real uh, actions in self-driving cars, 100 milliseconds may, can be very long, right. And then uh, longer term strategies. So, you know, the, uh, you basically, uh, do you make turn by turn decisions, which is tactic versus, you know, uh, try, uh, trying to, 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 to get around, you know, some congested areas and so on, and, and you know, the, trying to avoid what our, everyone else is doing using some game theory to, to determine how likely you're going to get into a less congested route, right? So that's the long-term strategy in, the, in this context. Trade-offs. Uh, you know, can you, you know, the, the, do you actually evaluate multiple decisions and say, oh, you know, maybe I should take this decision rather than that decision based on some of the pros and cons, right? And uh, debating with yourself. And immense knowledge, you know, the, so the, you know, in the, this network uh, in the cloud, you can have access to immense amount of knowledge, including where everyone else is, right? So Google Map will be able to have tremendous amount of knowledge about where it, other cars are and uh, you know, where, where they're kind of going and so on. So if you really want, you can tap into that knowledge and then make some you know, uh, uh, decisions and go, do global optimization and have some long-term memory about you know, how fast. For example, you know, the, if the person made a mistake last time when, the, you know, when, when, you, when you get into the street, maybe there should be a reminder and say, hey, uh, remember that thing? Don't turn there, okay? Wait a little bit longer before you turn, 
right? So the longer memory can really help you in, in, in very, very subtle but very valuable ways, right? So, um, you know, so when I look at an ideal AI device for, let's say, home assistant, you know, the, the, you know, this is kind of you know, my wish list, right? The, I would like to have you know, sensory data for about 10 megabyte per second, which is no big deal today, okay? It, it's pretty easy to accomplish. But the internal data, uh, access bandwidth, you know, I would like to see probably about 100 gigabyte per second. And that begins to be challenging for low cost devices. And um, uh, data latency. For sensory data, you know, I'd like to have probably, you know, order of one millisecond access so that the data does not, is not stale, right? Uh, you know, it's, but sensory data doesn't change too fast. So, the, you know, one millisecond is probably okay. But the internal data access, whenever I, I have, you know, I want to be able to, to, to verify my assumptions and so on, I would like to, to access data in order of microsecond or sub-microsecond. You know, I, I would like to be able to you know, do a lot of this checking you know, before I have to go back and answer questions. Uh, data capacity. I really like to have you know, uh, uh, at least a terabyte of data so that I don't have to go on the internet and, and, and uh, do, this, uh, do the search all the time in the servers. Right? Uh, I need to have some basic you know, capacity that I can you know, have enough local, fast, you know, very fast response time you know, the lookup of uh, you know, the, the different models, scenarios, knowledge, history. Compute throughput, you know, they like to have about 10 teraflops so that uh, we can have the inferences, hypothesis checking, and optimization and learning. You know, I would like to be able to talk to my, my, uh, my future Google Home that, you know, uh, when uh, I can say something like, well, uh, I don't really remember that, but uh, I think it starts with S and probably have you know, something like this, and, and it sounds like this, and then uh, can you check that word for me, right? And if you try to do that for Google Home, that thing is going to be totally confused today. Okay? So, so you know, this, this is what you know, I would like to, you know, to see in the, uh, you know, um, in the future, right? Another, so, another dimension is yeah. you missed cost. The cost has to be practical for that to be an edge device for a lot of applications. Yeah, so the, the, the comment is I missed cost. You know, the cost has to be low enough that uh, you, you become a viable you know, home assistant device. So the cost for this one is actually going to be somewhere around a dollar or so, right? So, <laughs> so, so it, is, it is very interesting, exactly right. So, so today, there's no way we can produce such a device. But if we work on it, we might be able to do it in a few years, right? Uh, so that's, you know, that, 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 that's what's going to make a difference. FPGA, you know, the, uh, how do we you know, create very, very cost efficient design for you know, IoT intelligence? So, you know, so uh, we, we produce a piece of tool that co-designs the neural net along with the, uh, the, uh, the hardware implementation. And we, we, we do the design space search and so on. And then, uh, we can you know, produce you know, more accurate result, lower power, and then uh, you know, uh, better energy efficiency by you know, systematically go through the Pareto curve and, uh, you know, in the design space. So um, you know, the, uh, I think you know, the, we should end soon. So you know, let me just kind of uh, uh, finish with a few comments about how we might be able to build those kind of devices at very low cost, okay, very low cost, and uh, achieve you know, what I was talking about. So let's take the historical context here. Um, on the left-hand side, I show the traditional uh, you know, CPU memory uh, storage network. This is about the time when I was, a, you know, I would say the kind of you know, uh, uh, machines when I was a grad student, you know, then uh, let's say Apple II, and um, you know, I'm, I'm beginning to date, date myself. So, <laughs> and, um, so you know, the, uh, the, the CPU has a memory channel, and then the, you know, it goes into the memory, and memory is very small. And I still remember when I started programming, uh, I had 48K memory available to me, right? Uh, 6502, remember that? Right, some of us probably do. So, um, <laughs> and then uh, we start to go into the parallel world because the memory gets, is getting bigger and then uh, we start to have you know, more, more, of, uh, you know, more need to be able to access the memory faster. So we started to have multiple memory channels and the uh, memory channels will go into uh, different memory banks and then uh, we can, you know, we can stripe the data into, you know, into these channels, and then we can get uh, better access, you know, bandwidth. 
So we also started to, to, to put in what we call the XPUs. And GPU started with the you know, AGP, Advanced Graphic Port. And then uh, you know, we, we got mi migrated into PCIe. So, so this is really where we start to have you know, this concept of fa uh, fabric. Because what happens is that uh, you, you have all these memory channels coming into the processor, but you need to get that data into the register file, into the, uh, into the, uh, the function units. So you need to have a fast way to route that data into the right place in the CPU. And that's the fabric. And today, the fabric is perhaps one of the, the very most power hungry part of any of the CPUs and GPUs. But they're extremely fast. They're very, very fast data switches. Okay. But if you look at it, these five uh, fabrics are designed mostly to, to route data from the channel into the CPU or from the CPU routed to the channel. There are two important, uh, there's another important direction that these fabrics don't really support yet. And so if you look at uh, the sort of the next one, uh, you know, I argue that uh, we're, we're entering a, a, a period of time where the storage is going to be lifted from the, uh, from the bottom into the memory. And Intel already started uh, that, uh, you know, that, that process with X point, and then uh, we have you know, multiple uh, manufacturers beginning to produce the, uh, you know, the, uh, the non-volatile memory technology that hopefully will eventually become the, uh, the memory so that the memory and storage can be accessed through the memory channels, not through the IO interconnect anymore. And this is supposed to be the biggest advantage in terms of accessing large amount of data in the future. We no longer need to sip the data through the IO channel okay, in the future. However, I believe that um, you know, uh, in the next few years, we'll be working on something like this. Um, we're going to have the CPU, you know, the fabric, that is not just connecting uh, the memory channels, but also the, what I call the XPU channels. So uh, these XPUs will be you know, integrated into the, uh, the, the memory slash storage. And um, uh, they will be providing some very important, uh, you know, the, I would call it the bandwidth uh, efficient uh, computation for the CPU or GPU. And then there's one important direct, uh, you know, the routing that uh, these, the fabric will need to do on the CPU. Remember, the fabric is a very, very fast, extremely fast switch. So in the system, if we have multiple of these, you know, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, GPUs and uh, TPUs and so on. These things really should be directly connected to the memory and the uh, XPU channels rather than going through the PCIe and, and so the, the I/O. Remember, you know, when we did the storage up, right? Now we need to, you know, promote the XPU up. And um, uh, this particular, you know, it, we're going to be. It's going to be very important that we have very very fast switching capability and uh, bandwidth between the XPUs. And one of the most valuable service, or the biggest value the future CPUs and GPUs can provide is to provide that switching capability between the special purpose logic. And whatever, whoever does this well and become the standard will become the next generation of most valuable CPUs uh, in the market. So that's my prediction. So, <coughs> So you know the um, if if I'm gonna you know the, just make a comment. If you look at the current generation system, this is a very simplified IBM uh, 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 IBM Nova, which is the, the Power Nine system with Volta GPUs. Um, you know the, these are the speeds and feeds in the system, and um, you know so we have the CPU host, and the CPU host is connected to the GPU through the uh, you know, uh, uh, through the uh, uh, NV link, which is 80 gigabyte per second, is very, very respectable. 80 gigabyte per second connection between the CPU and the GPU is the state of the art today. And then, uh, so uh, the GPU connects to its high bandwidth memory, HBM, uh, with 900 gigabyte per second, and that's very, very respectable. You know, that, that's something that uh, I, would, you know, I would salute to today. And uh, so that, you know, th this is a very nice design. And, uh, you know, I, I give NVIDIA a lot of credit, uh, you know, for, for, for getting this one right. However, when we start to, to take these into, you know, into a uh, real application point of view, 
let's say if we have a, a piece of data that needs to be accessed from HBM into the uh, Volta uh, GPU, the Volta GPU has a, a peak performance of 14 uh, single precision teraflops. And then if you go to the half part, uh, precision, it's even higher, right? Uh, so, you know, the, 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 but let's just argue based on the single precision here. And um, in order to, you know, to feed this Volta GPU, uh, the, 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 the compute, um, we have 900 gigabyte. Remember that very big number, 900 gigabyte per second, you know, feeding into the uh, Volta uh, you know, the, uh, compute. That means that we can you know, move 225 giga operands, giga operands into the GPU, okay? And um, so each operand, if we really want to have that Volta to sustain its peak performance, we need to reuse the operand 62.3 times in order to, you know, to be able to fully utilize that, uh, that Volta compute. Currently, there's only one computation that does it, and many of you probably know. It's the matrix multiplication. Okay, pretty much that. Okay, so, uh, so you know, the, or if you do a computation that does not have a reuse, then you can sustain less than 1.6% of the peak. So this is the reason why many people are confused. Because many people will say, the special purpose hardware would never beat a GPU. In terms of peak, I agree with that. But in terms of a non-reuse application, GPUs are very, very easy to beat. Okay. And you don't really need to have anywhere close to the GPU's uh, you know, the speed to be able to beat that sustained performance. Right? This is where the next generation hardware is going to be. And if you look at the data that has to come from the host DDR, because the, the HBM is expensive, it's small. And when we do the graph analytics and, and when we solve these big you know, in, uh, integer linear programming problems, the data is actually coming from the CPU DDR. And if you want to sustain the peak performance of this GPU, you need to reuse each data 700 times. I have not succeeded with anything yet in reusing the data 700 times. I have not seen it. So if you have an application that can reuse the data 700 times, I would like to get it. I'd like to put it under, uh, under the pedestal and then I would like to you know, publicize it greatly. But if you cannot, the other extreme is that you, if you cannot reuse the data, you will be sustaining less than zero, uh, uh, less than 0.14% of the peak performance. And these are the, the, the areas that if you want to build extremely fast and power efficient, cost efficient devices, these are the things that we really need to begin to redesign and rethink. So uh, I'm going to skip over these things, and then I'm just going to talk about you know, what Erudite is about. The Erudite, the first step is we get rid of the storage, and then uh, we put that into the, uh, the host memory, and then a CPU host, and then we, we make about uh, one terabyte of uh, memory out of it. One terabyte of memory is very, very expensive today. You can buy a one terabyte memory from IBM, okay, system from IBM. You, you definitely can buy it today but the price is actually quite a bit. It's more than my, my yearly salary for sure, but maybe some of you, you, know, have, you know, make more money than that, okay? So if you're interested, I can tell you the, the price that I, I, I know about, right? So, so what we do is we actually convert the flash storage into uh, main memory, okay? Because flash is the cheapest you know, the, uh, fast storage non-volatile memory that you can buy today. It has a lot of idiosyncrasies, it has a lot of problems, but you can build a very, very cheap one terabyte uh, memory system with flash today. And if we care about the cost, that's where I will go in the next few years. So what we did was uh, something critical. Um, people actually use flash as memory, but they use uh, flash as memory mapped device. And that memory map device still trigger page fault whenever you need to get data out of the flash. So what we did was we have a direct access time path, and the access 
does not trigger a page fault. It actually goes right into the, 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 the flash management layer, and it actually pulls the data out without the software intervention. And that alone can, uh, improves the, uh, the system performance by multiple times. Okay. And then, um, you know, so uh, then we, you know, we, uh, we create a, a new architecture, and we publish this, uh, this piece of work in the uh, in S plus uh, this year, and then we show that uh, you can build a you know the, a, a system with a very low cost but very large flat memory for the kind of you know, reasons that I just talked about. So you know we can put uh, non uh, uh, you know, uh, near memory computing into the uh, memory into the storage. So this is what we call the deep store, and then uh, you know, we can actually use you know use this to do content based. Uh, Voice, uh, voice search, you know, image search, text search, and this piece of work is just uh, you know, submitted for publication. And uh, we, uh, we use you know, the fairly small amount of uh, you know, uh, computation, two convolutions, one matrix multiplication, one matrix addition, and two comparison to do the content-based search. And this is something that we have already prototyped into the flash, uh, you know, the, the flash card based on the Xilinx FPGAs today. So let me summarize. You know, the, I don't want to keep you here for the whole night. Okay, so, you know, but hopefully I, I gave you a few things you know, that, uh, that are useful and a, a few you know, things to think about. One is um, you know, we, we're building this Erudite uh, you know, uh, system and, you know, with you know, very expensive, large uh, main memory uh, you know, with you know, compute that will be uh, bandwidth you know, efficient and uh, you know, the, uh, it, it will be sustainable. And uh, uh, we're you know, these things are driven by the high potential AI applications. You know, we, uh, we look at some of these applications and we say, okay, this is the reason why we need to have you know, the, these changes in the future architecture. It's supported by uh, you know, instrumentation analysis tools. We, if we cannot measure these things, we cannot improve them. Okay, so we, we really need to have, you know, continue to build these instrumentation tools and then you know, these analysis tools so that we can continue to evaluate what we build and then uh, we can improve that uh, with the industry. We uh, need to design with modern software interfaces in mind. You know, if we build a system today without understanding the, the cloud, all the cloud infrastructure, the you know the uh, things you know the uh, things like the uh, you know the uh, the, uh, the you know, HTTP protocols and then the uh, the kind of the network boundaries and the uh, you know the React you know uh, pr uh, uh, interfaces and so on. If our instrumentation system cannot see through those kind of interfaces, we're not going to be able to handle real applications. The real applications are not built with Fortran anymore, and that's a hard lesson I had to learn. Right. <laughs> And uh, removing the file system bottleneck from access path for large data sets. You know, I, I have a sign you know, in my office, file system, <laughs> right? Because uh, the file system, the page fault and so on, you know, we, we really don't want to have that, in, you know, these kind of you know, traditional software overhead in accessing these very large data sets. They will have to be supported for, for you know, the compatibility reasons. But you know there are our ways that we can support them, uh, you know, in the future. <laughs> Increase memory parallelism in accessing very large data sets. The DDR, the, uh, the not the DDR, the uh, the flash, the uh, solid state uh, disk drive, you know, uh, industry have only provided the internal memory parallelism in these, you know. Flash chips and flash modules are much, much bigger than they are currently exposed uh, to the system de developers. The reason is all these devices have been accessed through PCIe or even lesser uh, you know, I.O. interconnects. So there's not enough motivation for them to provide even more parallelism you know, because they already are saturating the I.O. interface that the data has to go through into the system. However, if we start to build memory systems out of these things, suddenly they, they need to uh, keep up with the memory channels. They need to be, uh, begin to keep up with the much higher you know, uh, uh, data transportation capabilities. So this is about time that uh, we, we would need, begin to need to uh, work with the vendors. And originally, I thought this is going to be a non-starter for the vendors. Turned out that when I talked to both dominating flash 
you know, the uh, vendors, both are very open to increasing the level of memory parallelism. But we need to, to build a system prototype to help them to, you know, to make that business case to be able to, you know, to, to put in that change. Placing compute into the appropriate levels of memory system hierarchy. And um, this, is, this is a very active uh, area of research. There are many, many uh, you know, uh, detailed problems that, uh, you know, that we need to solve. But the most important challenge is the programming. How do we you know, to provide a good programming interface so that you know, uh, activating one of these you know, compute devices in the memory system is as easy or as difficult as it is to launch a subroutine in the CPU or a kernel in the GPU today. Okay? But then we're not there yet. And um, data access bandwidth proportional to the data capacity. So you know, the, it, 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 the only way that I can see how we can you know, the, uh, continue to scale that uh, access bandwidth is by distributing the compute devices <coughs> into the uh, memory. And collaborating, you know, the collaborative uh, you know, uh, near memory acceleration execution with CPUs and GPUs. And this is the key that we have, to, uh, uh, we have to have in order for the programming systems to work. Without some of the basic capability for the CPU and GPU to be able to very easily can communicate and then synchronize and collaborate with these devices, we will not be able to get the programming systems to work. And we should really shoot for more than 100 times improvement in power efficiency and performance in these future systems. They are attainable, but they, they would require some important uh, you know, changes uh, in, the hot, uh, in the industry. And so that now we can do robust, high efficiency uh, AI applications in the future. So thank you. So do we have time for a few questions, perhaps? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So if you were going to sell this to Facebook today, just I know it's a research system. Um, what would you tell them they could use it for today? Yeah. Based on so the question is, if I try to sell, uh, sell it to Facebook today, you know, uh, what am I going to, to tell them in terms of the additional capabilities that um, you know, the, uh, they can have? So um, let me just, uh, I, I don't know the details of Facebook, to be honest. Right? Uh, Facebook that does a whole lot of work. And I just came back from Facebook yesterday, and I don't pretend that I, I really know all the activities of Facebook. But I can, maybe let me speculate a little bit. So uh, you know, uh, one thing is that um, um, when currently uh, people can do things like, um, you know, let's say, uh, image search you know, on, on Facebook, pretty you know, reasonably well. But very, there's no good way to do video search on these things. And especially you know, the uh, semantic-based video search you know you I, I want to get you know certain kind of you know uh, activities or you know the, in, in certain areas and so on and there's just no capability that I see there may be some experimental uh, capability and I would love to learn so so from the you know, the hardware and the you know uh, plus the new AI uh, task libraries would definitely enable more things like that and even in some cases, you know, the, uh, Facebook is having trouble with some of these you know, potential censorship kind of things. And um, you know, it's a very, very complex problem. But they actually don't have the right tools, even the right tools, to be able to evaluate you know, or to be able to have a high level assessment of you know, what each, you know, which, each policy and so on will, will, will mean. Right? So these things will give them some important tools to be able to deal with those. I know they can recognize my face yes. in a picture. Yes, image search, they are actually doing very well. I, I actually saw it. <laughs> Absolutely. It's traditional uh, yeah. computing to do that. Yeah, so for image search, they have reasonable, they have reasonable capabilities today. Yeah. Uh, but by the way, uh, it's not quite the same because if you have a, let's say, a picture of you today, and uh, oh, okay, not you. A picture of me today versus my picture when I was in high school. They're not going to be able to find it. So yes. Uh, in that picture you had of the future computer system, did you really mean that the XPU ex 
accelerator was on the memory bus, or did you just mean it was directly connected to the host CPU? Ah, okay. So uh, the question is, uh, when I show the, the future computer system uh, picture, uh, when I put that XPU in, uh, in that memory box, do I mean that the, 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 the XPUs are connected to the memory channels and, uh, you know, or even you know, inside the memory modules uh, versus they're just being directly connected into that fabric so that they can communicate with each other? Uh, the answer is both. Because uh, you know, the, uh, immediately, you know, we already you know, begin to see that uh, you know, uh, uh, for NVLink, you know, uh, they're beginning to put, uh, you know, connect the, the CPUs, uh, the GPUs you know, th directly into the, uh, to the, to the CPU, right? And uh, uh, if you look at the next generation uh, servers, these things are already happening because uh, you know, the, the next generation servers no longer have different physical wires for you know, PCIe versus the memory channel uh, wires and so on. They're all the same wires now, okay? And they just, you just run different protocols. So uh, I may be saying things that I shouldn't be saying, perhaps. Uh, I'm being broadcast. Uh, uh, so let me stop there. Uh, uh, so so the, the, the point is, you know, these things are, uh, you know, the, the PCIe kind of wires are going to be connected into the CPU, you know, the, the CPU fabric. Okay, so, so these things are already happening in the next generation, okay. But the, the, the interesting part is that, you know, let's say if I put some, you know, uh, compute device into the memory, uh, into the, you know, next to the memory controller, you know, me next to the memory uh, banks, right, in, inside, the, uh, inside these dims and so on. So no matter how well you place your data, no matter how hard you're going to work, these compute devices will occasionally need data from other, from other memory parts, okay? It, it's not gonna, it, you're not gonna be able to eliminate those kind of problems. So having the ability for those, you know, uh, for the other memory banks and computing devices to be able to ship data to you through that fast switch, through that low latency protocol, rather than the long latency PCIe protocol and so on, will be critical for, the, for those things to be competitive and to be able to, to be energy efficient. That's what I was trying to say. Thanks. Well, yeah. Last question, just to that, you mentioned that you wanted a faster switch coverage so the PCI transactions can go direct to between devices. Wouldn't it be easier to kind of have a, you know, a out of band channel between them to just have a much faster communication? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the question is, you know, the, uh, since the goal is to have very high bandwidth, you know, the connection between these devices, why do you bother to go through the CPU? Why don't you just improve the PCIe switch, for example, right? Uh, no, I'm saying actually you can connect the devices directly without going through yeah, the CPU. Yeah, yeah. So why don't you just provide a separate network yeah. uh, uh, among these devices? It's about how, how expensive it, uh, you, you want to produce these devices. It's so all, you know, yeah. 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 Well, but you know, my my vision is that uh, at some point we should have a you know, one dollar chip, okay, that has these kind of you know connect uh, connectivity through the you know, as a service on the CPU, right? So for the low cost devices, that's in my opinion that's going to be the the viable model. But if you are looking at, you know, let's say top quality servers that uh, you really want to be able to do some you know, very, very uh, advanced data, you know, data uh, you know, the processing. I can see startups doing that kind of stuff in the next few years. I can actually see it. And then you can actually remove a lot of the memory, the storage which you are saying into the GPU itself. You can do it one with much higher active data sets. Yeah, so the, the, the comment is that the, if you are willing to build that network you know, among these devices, you can avoid a lot of the, you know, the, you help with even some of the I.O. problems and so on. And so the, I very much agree with you.
um, and, that, um, and, that, and that completely shifts who sits on top in this uh, yes. framework. Yeah, the comment is that, um, you know, the, um, you know it, it's a very similar question. So the, the, uh, the question is, you know, the, where should that inter uh, fabric be? You know, should that be on a silicon, uh, CPU silicon, or it should be you know, the, something else? So uh, you know, the, the way I see it is that um, you know, if we are taking an evolution point of view, then uh, you know, it will be natural for the CPU and even the GPU designers to provide these, you know, these downward, you know, uh, uh, upward and downward uh, switch capabilities. It, it's a fairly reasonable step for them to take to be able to get there quickly. But it doesn't mean that uh, there will not be competing approaches. I, I, the, the, I can see, for example, your company will be thinking about something competing. I can, I can definitely see it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so the question is, you know, the, uh, we, we see these, you know, the very, very vibrant uh, activities in the uh, application development, you know, very fast advancement. We see all these proliferations of, you know, the devices and the advancement of these devices, the memory, you know, the capabilities and so on. So how about compilers? You know, the, how, are, it, are compilers going to be able to, you know, to, to keep up? You know, the, the my, my, you know that I, I work on compilers for years, right? Uh, so you know, the, for about 15 years of my career, uh, I was building the, uh, the VLIW compiler uh, you know, with uh, Intel and HP. And um, uh, I'm not sure if I want to repeat that, uh, you know, that, that whole uh, process. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, the, the, the answer is, uh, I believe that we're not going to be building traditional compiler technologies you know, in the traditional sense. But there is a very big need to be able to take more a algorithm uh, you know, description and being able to synthesize the kind of code that we want to execute on, each, you know, on many of these different devices. Because that's going to be the critical cost for, you know, the, for most of the, uh, the, the system companies. If you, you know, the, the, right now, in my group, uh, we have a tool called Tangram, and uh, we take the performance critical GPU code described in C++, and uh, we synthesize the best performing code for six generations of GPUs. And every piece of code is very different. I would not dare to ask my grad students to, to, uh, to maintain all those versions of code you know, I, thought, I think they will all find other advisors. So, you know, we, I'm already seeing this. So, you know, I can see that moving forward, you know, when, when you start to build, you know, these you know, accelerators, new, new compute devices, new TPUs, new, you know, uh, tensor cores, new whatever, you know, someone has to generate that code. And I believe that, um, you know, we can synthesize code into those devices efficiently, but these are all still research topics. But they have, you know, something has to happen. Yes? Uh, your, your general opinion about uh, AI field and development, on one hand you have the big iron AI developments, the teraflops, terabytes, at the other end you have low cost, pervasive, Amazon Echo, yeah. Google Home. Yeah. Who's gonna, who's gonna advance faster in AI? Ah, uh, okay, so. I mean, you got millions, <laughs> tens of millions, hundreds of millions. Yeah, so the question is this. The question is, um, you know, uh, I showed those, uh, a, a picture of, uh, you know, edge uh, device, uh, AI devices versus the cloud server, you know, the servers. And uh, the question is, you know, the way that uh, I portray them are somewhat different, and the, uh, what, which one is going to advance faster? So uh, on one side, uh, you're going to have a market, potential market of billions of devices. Right, that these are Internet of Things and you know the uh, you know personal devices and so on, and um, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, you know for the super duper servers, each one is going to, to make you a lot of money, but there are probably very few of them. 
So um, you know, uh, I think, you know, honestly, I think that most of the progress will likely come from the lower end, you know, for various reasons. So, but you know, that's just my my personal opinion. Yeah. Would you be open to uh, placing a link to the PDF of the slides on the meeting yes. page? Yes. Yeah. There's like a discussion area. Yeah. So if you just place a link there, that would be great. I I will do so. Thank you so much. Right. And um, we need to do the door prize drawing if we can. Uh, Yeah, so uh, the comment is we're going to be uh, doing door price drawing. And uh, so I, I, I thought people wanted to listen to me, but uh, I think the real reason is the door price. <laughs> but uh, no, so, uh, you know, the, the, let, uh, so uh, the other question, is, uh, comment is the, the uh, door price, and there's something else. No. Just that. Just okay, that. great. So to, uh, please you know, the, make sure that you, uh, you, you do the door price uh, dr uh, drawing. Okay, good. Yes. Uh, first off, two things. Uh, one, I'm with the uh, Silicon Valley ACM cigarettes, and our next two meetings, one is going to be using convolutional neural nets to deal with uh, 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 nanos, uh, single photon uh, imaging, uh, for instance, for cars, and being able to resolve things in uh, sub uh, nanosecond, you know, femtosecond range. So. By the way, there's a lot of innovation in that field. It's yeah. very fascinating. And the other, other meeting we're having is in June, is Intel is, has a Carla uh, car simulation for, for testing the cars. And I'm wondering, most of the models you talk about are more like static you know, situations. And I was wondering how, how those dynamic uh, models are, are interacting. Yeah. Uh, so the question is that uh, uh, you know, there, uh, there are some simulation models for, let's say, self-driving cars and so on. That uh, you know, so most of the things that I talk about here, you know, like natural language processing and so on, tend to be you know the, uh, more static. So the, uh, the, uh, the the answer is ultimately all these things are will all have to be dynamic, because you know even you know some of the natural language processing, the kind of things that I talk about actually has been developed for decades. And then, uh, so most of them assume a relatively stationary you know, uh, you know, the text and so on. But you know, you, we all know that uh, when we talk to each other, uh, you know, through the conversation, we actually help each other to build a mental model about what we mean, right? That we clarify things and so on. So uh, you know, these things eventually will all come into these kind of things. And uh, for self-driving cars, you know, the, I have been you know, uh, talking to a few people about uh, you know, the, the simulation and so on. So I think one of the, uh, the most important uh, you know, uh, area that uh, people will be working on is that, um, you know, that how, you know, how low level uh, this simulation uh, will be and how, how much fidelity they will have. For example, uh, are you simulating at the sensor you know, sensor level, you know, the, all the, you know, uh, uh, all the, let's say, LIDAR, you know, uh, rays and bouncing and so on, or are you really simulating at a video game level where, you know, you, you have some kind of assumed sensor, sensory input from the scenery, and then you say, how are they, you know, the chain, uh, how are they really, you know, how are you going to make the turns based on a kind of a video game level input? And I believe that uh, you know, if we really, really want to understand how these AI systems will work, we need to go down to the, to, to the real level because the sensory uh, data processing in itself is a huge AI challenge. And then uh, if we simulate at too high a level, we're going to miss some real problems you know, in the future. But that's just my personal opinion following some of this work. Okay. Thank you very much for staying with me.